First up is Steve Keen, to my left, who is familiar to most of you. Steve's a professor and distinguished research fellow at the Institute for Strategy, Resilience, and Security at the University College London. And Steve's going to explain why some of our most revered economic models of climate change aren't trustworthy and why we shouldn't rely on them to make decisions about our future. And then he's going to talk about other options. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, we all know that the Nobel Prize is about to be awarded again. Last year it was awarded uh, to two people, one of whom was William Nordhaus, for the integrating climate change into long-run macroeconomic analysis. Uh, and this is a key slide from the lecture that uh, Nordhaus gave as part of receiving the Nobel Prize. There are a number of trajectories identified there for temperature between now and 2150. And he described one of those as optimal with a four degree increase in temperature above pre-industrial levels by 2140. Optimal. Four degrees greater than pre-industrial levels. Now in what way could you regard a four degree increase in temperature over pre-industrial levels as optimal? Well the basic logic was it minimises the cost of abasement and the cost of climate change together. If he said we did no abatement whatsoever, in other words, we simply let the climate proceed as it is with the level of carbon dioxide and other pollutants we're pumping into the atmosphere, then the temperature would be greater than six degrees above pre-industrial levels. And the net present value damage of that would be 23 trillion, slightly more than the US economy. The cost of abatement therefore is zero. Now, if we go for optimal abatement, which would reduce temperature to minimise it to a four degree increase, or about four degrees over pre-industrial, the damages would be 15 trillion, less than the size of the US economy now, and cost of abatement three. And those are the calculations there. Now, six months before he gave that talk, a genuine climate scientist, William, uh, Will Steffen, described the likelihood of a four degree increase in temperature this way. The tropics are uninhabitable. And the punchline down the bottom there, the maximum carrying capacity of the planet about one billion humans versus seven and a half billion now. Now, how on earth can you square those two visions of the future? What I believe before I started reading these papers in detail was that economists were applying a very high discount rate to the same estimates of damage. I found that wasn't the case. They were in fact making up their own estimates using a range of methods, the most absurd of which is the following. They were using today's variation in GDP and temperature across the planet and believing they could use that to estimate the impact of climate change over time. This is when one of the key papers aggregating their so-called empirical research. They assume the observed variation of economic activity with climate over space holds over time as well. Sounds very clever. It's incredibly stupid. What they did was they took data on GDP and temperature today across the globe, mainly across America, and they found a weak quadratic relationship between temperature and GDP. They then assumed that same relationship would apply as we massively increase the amount of energy retained from the, from the sun by adding to greenhouse gases. They called it the statistical approach. There's a number of different labels they use for it. This is one of the first papers to do it, not the only by far. He said the climate response functions were quadratic. Countries that are currently cooler are going to benefit. Countries that are currently warmer will be harmed. And the cross-sectional, putting all the data together, they presumed that an increase in temperature, I think three degrees in this case, would bring benefits of $145 billion per year. Now that became a data point that Nordhaus used to estimate his damage function, which is simply a quadratic. It's the temperature difference uh, over pre-industrial level squared, multiplied by a coefficient. Of course, he had to work out what that coefficient was. So using Similar to this sort of data and equally flawed data, there's Mendelssohn's data point with a 0.1% with a increase in GDP courtesy of a 2.5 degree increase in global temperature. 
These are others that use the same, same idea. That's Nordhaus's own contribution in 94, assuming the same relationship. And the coefficient has been just in the most recent papers reduced it yet again. His coefficient for that quadratic is 0 0.00227, meaning that a one degree increase in temperature over pre-industrial, he assumes, will cause a 0.227% fall in global GDP. This is before discounting, by the way. This is not discounted. This is simply what they say the actual damage will be. Two degrees will cause less than a 1% one fall. Four degrees will just cause a 3.6% fall. Even 10 degrees would just reduce GDP by 23% over what it would have been in the complete absence of global warming. Now, these conclusions are only valid if and only if the assumption that the variation we see across space today will be the same over time with the incredible increase in the amount of energy that we'd be retaining in the biosphere courtesy of additional greenhouse gases. And I got involved in a fairly acrimonious exchange with one of the economists who'd been writing these IPCC reports for some years now, William Toll, oh, Richard Toll, pardon me. And as part of that, he said, this is one of his traits, 10 degrees Kelvin is less than the temperature difference between Alaska and Maryland, blah, blah, blah. Climate is not a primary driver of income. This is one of the people drafting the IPCC reports. Now, a meteorologist intervened in this discussion and said that a global climate 10 degrees warmer than the present is not remotely the same thing as taking the current climate and simply adding 10 degrees everywhere. Toll's response to that was to say, that's not the point. We see people thrive in very different climates. Climate determinism, therefore, has no empirical support. And he finally said, if you can't show that it holds over space, why can you say that it holds over time? Now, what they've done is they've taken GDP in two places, normally in America, and compared them while the level of energy in the biosphere remains constant. You're not looking at change over time. Okay? What global warming will do is dramatically increase the amount of energy in the biosphere, completely disrupting the existing climate, disrupting human life as well as a result of that. You get no information whatsoever about the impact of global warming by looking at local temperature to GDP relationships. And I want to give a little simple illustration of this just for the sake of exposition. So let's assume, and this is simply for the sake of exposition, I don't believe it, okay? Let's assume temperature is a linear sum of the global temperature caused by our location in the Goldilocks zone around our star, plus local deviation caused by whereabouts you are on that, the surface of the planet. And assume that there's a linear relationship between GDP and temperature as well. So the hypothesis they had was something like this. GDP per capita is a function of two temperatures, the global temperature given by the Goldilocks location the, uh, and, and, and by greenhouse gases, uh, pre-industrial levels, plus local deviation. So you've got alpha 1 times global temperature plus alpha 2 times local temperature. And then you get, well, let's look at that for Florida. So the local deviation in America, it's 7 degrees higher than the average for America. Uh, for Dakota, it's 10 degrees below. Uh, then you do a calculation, you subtract the two, you get a relationship saying the difference between the two is 17 times the value of your coefficient for the local temperature variation. You've cancelled out your global temperature variation. You then can solve for alpha 2, get an estimate of it. You have no information on alpha 1, so you assume alpha 1 equals alpha 2. That is outrageously stupid, and not just stupid in some academic exercise. This is threatening the existence of human society. If anybody's going to bring capitalism undone, it's going to be the economist who wrote this research. <laughs> now, it's like having, and I want to give a, a graphic illustration of what this is like. This is like having north-south data on a mountain, not having any east-west. But because it's flat, you tell the hikers that walking east-west is safe because north-west is flat. And you're on the edge of El Capitan. That's about as smart as what economists have done in this case. And this fatally unrealistic climate data, I'm putting in inverted commas, was calibrated to equally unrealistic damage functions. Um, and it's the difficulty is we're trying to grasp something we haven't experienced. So I want to say 
we can actually use their models and use their assumptions, which are the quadratic damage functions, to look at things we actually have experienced because we have experienced, as a species, lower temperatures than today. The last ice age. When you go backwards and look at the temperature records, you find that the last ice age was about four degrees below the average for 1951 to 1980. So what was the planet like then? And what does Nordhaus's damage function predict would be the impact on GDP if we were facing global cooling rather than global warming? Well, 20,000 years ago, it was four degrees cooler. That's what the planet looked like. Nordhaus prediction, that would reduce GDP by 3.6%. <laughs> he deserves to be laughed at, not given a Nobel Prize. OK? And yet this is the basis of economists saying we don't need to worry about it and assuring politicians they don't need to worry. It's sheer nonsense. Again, just to make the obvious, New York would be, a meter, it would be one kilometre below ice. That's not going to affect GDP by more than 3.6%. You simply cannot extrapolate to that world from our current data, but that's what they've been doing. Now, why do they ignore tipping points? They talk about it all the time, but it never turns up in their function, certainly not in Nordhausers. He's actually made it less capable of handling tipping points in his most recent paper. It's because you can't do cost-benefit analysis when you have discontinuities. So the response of the economist was, let's ignore the tipping points. Now, what the climate scientists are saying, and they're saying it much more politely than me, I hope they're going to join me in being as rude as is necessary to get through on this front, they're saying abandon cost-benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. Stefan published a, a joint paper with about 16 other climate scientists just recently, and they've said very mildly, the contemporary way of guiding development founded on beliefs of gradual and incremental change will not likely be adequate to cope with this trajectory. Well, it certainly won't, because they're not even imagining that that trajectory is what we actually face. So my position on having read this data, reading the IPC reports, we should remove economists from the IPCC. <laughs> if not that, we should at least appoint non-mainstream economists who would not make such a stupid assumption. People like myself, Campagliano, Garrett, Gerard, Grisselli, there's a number of people doing non-orthodox work on that. We would not agree to that assumption and get climate scientists to vet what's being done. Now, what is happening because we're not doing this is climate change denialists, or what I think are better called climate change trivialisers, are using the IPCC to justify trivialising. I don't need to introduce Bjorn Lomborg to anybody here. And here are a few statements by him. Today's Nobel laureate shows optimal climate solution is, uh, is 3.5 degree temperature increase. He's quoting the IPC again, showing those damage function points. Uh, six degrees is likely to reduce by six to 12 per cent of GDP. Okay. And he's quoting the IPCC, he's quoting economists to make these statements. And he rubbishes the, um, the students getting involved, the, uh, the Extinction Rebellion. And then he says, he has nowhere near a uh, problem. IPC impacts smaller than most other drivers. Let's take a good look at this. He actually is quoting the IPCC. For most economic sectors, the impact of climate change will be small relative to the impact of other drivers, and they say, the, uh, including population. Medium evidence, high agreement. So the whole group of economists who are putting this together have fallen into the same group think of believing that ridiculous assumption that data about temperature and GDP today can be used to predict the impact of climate change. And you won't be amazed to see who one of the authors is, lead authors of that particular document. We should be using data from the climate scientists themselves, including the work that Stefan has done and others to identify tipping points. Of course, the first of those tipping points is probably already gone, Arctic winter sea ice. And the cascade that will cause will mean we simply can't stay at the uh, levels of temperature that these economists think is going to be benign. We need models that actually, in which energy plays a fundamental role. Now, none of them are neoclassical models, none of the post-Keynesian models yet properly include energy properly. I'm starting to do that work with uh, Griselli and Garrett. And when we feed that in, we can get both cyclical economic behaviour followed by economic collapse in this particular simple illustration of running out of resources. It's simple and it's stylized, but it's already more realistic than what Nordhaus have done because it includes resource constraints that are absent 
from the work being done by these so-called climate economists. So, and I, you know I'm a critic of mainstream economics. That's no secret. But my criticisms here are not dependent upon me rejecting things like the Ramsey growth model and so on. I haven't even got to the Ramsey growth model yet. It's just the stupid assumptions they're making. No self-respecting neoclassical economist should purport what these people are doing. And several beforehand, before me, have come out and said these are crucially, crucially flawed. Next to useless, they're worse than useless. They've distracted us from the important challenge we face and it's time we shut them down. Thank you. Thank you.